we just keep track of that as we go. And I just do want to recognize that we have uh, a, a conflict and some people might be uh, di dividing their attention tonight. This is our OR earlier this week, where I do have to say it is a pleasure to have Toronto and Montreal fans uh, amidst us uh, in, our, in our ORs. So, uh, but I do want to try to end uh, at eight if we go a little bit over and I respect if people have to leave uh, a little early or leave right on time, I should say, but hopefully we'll try to end the session right at eight o'clock and hopefully we're done by the second period for everybody. Um, so this is again, sort of a set up by our group at uh, the Hamilton General and our upper extremity group uh, is kind of helped put together tonight's uh, night. And that's why we have uh, our two moderators from our trauma and upper extremity reconstruction group. Uh, Dr. Chris Reed is one of our fellows coming to us uh, from Dalhousie and uh, has a background in arthroplasty and now is developing expertise in trauma and upper extremity with us. And Dr. Bill Rosevsky uh, is our, one of our trauma and upper reconstruction uh, fellow upper extremity reconstruction um, uh, uh, clinicians, surgeons, and he's an associate professor with our department and runs the undergrad CTU uh, service at the Hamilton General as well and has very much, uh, has a lot of involvement in all kinds of research. And uh, I want to put a warm welcome out to our panel. Uh, we have a, a great group of experts with us on both upper and lower extremity to discuss some of the concepts and the cases. Dr. Julie Adams is joining us all the way from the University of Tennessee. Uh, and she previously was at the Mayo Clinic, and she is an upper extremity hand, specifically hand and upper extremity surgeon, um, uh, and then heavily involved in AOS as well as the uh, Hand Society. Dr. Brad Newcap joins us from Ottawa. He's uh, trained at the University of Calgary in trauma and uh, is now, and also did foot and ankle fellowship, and he runs trauma and foot and ankle uh, at the Level One Trauma Center. Uh, over at the University of Ottawa, and we have Dr. Buckley joining us from Calgary. Uh, again, and you know, humbled to have uh, this, him as a master educator and, and sharing some cases with us tonight on foot and ankle and his expertise, and as well, uh, equally humbled with Dr. Dominique Carlo joining us from Montreal. Uh, truly an expert in upper extremity, and, and, and uh, especially with uh, proximal humerus fractures, would be really interesting to have her uh, share her expertise with us tonight. And We'll have our schedule set up with Dr. Reed presenting a first case, uh, and now we follow Dr. Muellenkamp, who will be joined by Dr. Uh, Bill Hayden, one of the residents in Ottawa, presenting a case there. Um, Dr. Buckley also has a case uh, to share with us, and I think potentially Dr. Rulo has another upper extremity case to share with us, but we'll see how time is going. And with that, I do want to turn it over to Dr. Reed to begin our evening. Perfect. Oh, I think just you're on mute there, Chris. Can you hear me now? It's better, yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, and thanks a lot, Dr. Johal, for uh, introduction. My name is Chris Ree, and I'm currently doing a fellowship in opportunity and trauma at McMaster. Uh, thanks again for this opportunity to present the case, participate in discussion, and uh, hoping to uh, gain more insights from uh, more experienced senior surgeons. Uh, so I'll be presenting a, a case for a proximal humerus fracture. Um, so this is the 69-year-old uh, uh, gentleman uh, who is right-handed. Uh, other than mild COPD, he's otherwise a very healthy gentleman and also physically very active. Uh, he presented himself to the emergency department after he fell off the bike and landed on his right shoulder. Uh, pain was localized to his right shoulder and there is no open wound, no obvious deformity, and uh, a neurovascular exams are uh, unremarkable. Uh, he didn't have any other associated injuries. And uh, on the right side of the screen, uh, this is the AP X-ray of his uh, right shoulder. Um, so I'm gonna pick one of the residents. Um, is Dr. Phil Hishe here? Uh, yeah, hey, Dr. Ree. Yeah, hi. Yeah, so can you describe what you're seeing on this image? And also uh, let me know when you want to see the other views. Uh, yeah, so we have a single AP of the right shoulder. Um, there is a uh, minimally displaced surgical neck fracture. Um, on this single view, the glenohumeral joint looks congruent, but I want to get multiple views, uh, including a Velcro to um, have a better look at it. Uh, 
And uh, here are the uh, transcapsular Y view and the axillary view. Uh, anything you'd like to comment? Uh, yeah, so um, overall, uh, looks like a surgical neck fracture, slight apex, uh, looks anterior, um, but otherwise minimally displaced. Um, so in a 69-year-old gentleman, I plan to treat this non-operatively in a cuff and collar, bring him back in a week or two for some repeat radiographs. Yeah. Good. So uh, exactly. So uh, given that the fracture is minimally displaced, uh, the decision was made to treat this non-operatively. And um, here are some additional images. So uh, these X-rays are taken at two weeks and uh, six weeks uh, post-injury uh, respectively. So uh, Dr. Ishii again, uh, can you describe what you're seeing on these images? Uh, yeah. So um, there's been further progression of deformity, so it looks like uh, there's been shortening and uh, the head's fallen into, fallen into varus as well. Um, I don't appreciate too much healing, so um, I want to know how far out he is from the, from the injury. Yeah, so the left uh, x-ray is a two weeks after uh, injury, and the right side is a six weeks. Yeah, so I'm worried that there's progressive uh, varus angulation at the fracture site. Um, have a discussion with him. I, th I think at six weeks, it's still possible to treat this um, conservatively. Um, I do think that his long-term shoulder function would, is not going to be as great with this uh, if it does heal in this amount of varus. Um, but I'd probably follow him along with some repeat radiographs. Okay, so um, so at that time, a patient uh, wasn't very interested in surgery, uh, so it has uh, continued to be treated non-operatively. And uh, again, uh, the the image on the right side shows his X-ray at three and months, uh, uh, three and a half months post-injury. Uh, clinically, he continues to be quite symptomatic with a lot of pain, and is not able to tolerate uh, any forms of physiotherapy. And uh, as you can all see on this x-ray, this is a significant varus alignment, which is not that much different from his previous uh, six-week uh, post-injury film. And also there is a lack of radiographic healing as well. Um, so at this point, the discussion was made uh, with the patient about the treatment options and uh, decided to go ahead with the surgery. Uh, so getting back to you again, Dr. Hache, um, any investigation you would like to order before going ahead with the surgery? Um, yeah, I think a CT scan to better assess the uh, the bone stock would be helpful and have a better look at the tuberosities, although they look like they're reasonably intact. Good. So these are some, uh, uh, sorry, these are corona cuts from the CT scan. I'm going to run it a couple of times so we all have a good look at it. And... Uh, and these are the sagittal cuts. And sorry, I hope I can run it slower, but I, I don't know how to. And then these are the uh, axial cuts. Um, yeah, so, um, so by the time the patient was referred to our hospital, uh, it was around four months post-injury. And as you can see on the CT scan, it uh, demonstrated again the uh, varus malalignment uh, at the fracture side with delayed union. Um, so what are the uh, surgical options uh, at this point? Um, yeah, so, I mean, quickly on the CT scan, so it definitely looks like there's delayed not, uh, delayed union. Um, surgical options at this point, you said he's 69? He's a 69, but very uh, healthy. Very healthy. Um, so surgical options at this point would be open reduction internal fixation. Um, but I'd also be prepared with either a, most likely a hemiarthroplasty I'd want to have, um, available if needed. And if he was, um, a little bit worse off physiologically, I think he's starting to become, he's getting on the group that would potentially benefit from a, uh, reverse total shoulder arthroplasty as well. But my primary goal would be, uh, open reduction internal fixation. Right. Um, so at, at that time, we decided to go ahead with the uh, open reduction and internal fixation, uh, given that he's a physiologically young and a physically active patient. Um, he also didn't have any pre-existing shoulder problem. Um, any, um, um, any challenges you would encounter in the OR for, uh, for surgical fixation of this kind of, uh, kind of injury? 
Um, I'd want to have a better look at the CT scan. It did look like there was a bit of a, a bony void there. Um, I mean, obviously correcting that uh, varus uh, deformity is going to be super important in restoring your medial calcar. Um, so I think the uh, the option of having a fibular stratigraft is uh, that's a really good adjunct to help restore that medial calcar um, if you find that there's bone loss there and we can't otherwise restore it. Um, I want to get some sutures into the rotator cuff um, because it seems like that's what's causing the varus deformity and that can help um, reduce that deformity uh, as well. Yeah, so and, and it's, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, in addition to uh, freshening up the fracture site, dividing any sclerotic ends as well. Right. So as, as you rightly mentioned, uh, uh, one of the main uh, problems we thought it would uh, encounter will be, uh, would be the, uh, the lack of a medial support uh, due to the chronic seat of the fracture in a, uh, in a uh, various malalignment. Uh, so uh, there was no good uh, medial calca support uh, shown on both the X-ray and the CT scan. Uh, and also because the uh, proximal fragment is in various for such a long time, uh, the rotator cuff will be uh, quite short and contracted for a long time. So this would make it difficult to correct the uh, uh, various uh, malalignment. Um, so in the OR, uh, we did a, a standard delta pectoral approach to expose a fracture. Uh, after suturing the rotator cuff tendons at its insertion with heavy non-observable sutures, uh, we bluntly dissected to release the subrocomial space uh, so that we, we can mobilize the proximal fragment and correct the various the deformity. Uh, then we placed the fibular strut allograft to restore the medial calcar. Uh, we uh, preliminary held it with the K-wire. Then we reduced the, reduced the fracture and also held it with the K-wire. Uh, we checked with the fluoro and we are happy with this pre preliminary reduction. So we went ahead with the uh, uh, fixation with the proximal humerus locking plate. Uh, and then the uh, this fixation was supplemented by tying down the sutures, holding the rotator cuff to the to the plate. And um, these are some of the uh, intraoperative uh, images. Uh, so I'm not sure how well everyone can see, but uh, you can see a fibular strut allograft um, adding the support for the uh, medial column. So yeah, good job, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Heche, and. Um, just um, wanna quickly go through another case of a proximal humerus fracture that uh, that the uh, fibula shot allograft was utilized. utilized. Uh, and uh, this is a patient with a very uh, different demographic, different comorbidities. Uh, so this is a 58 year old gentleman who is uh, quite uh, comorbid. He has a, a kidney transplant patient uh, due to a complication of uh, his longstanding type two diabetes. Uh, he also has hypertension, hypothyroidism, and some of the other complications of a uh, long-standing diabetes, such as retinopathy. Uh, he fell from a standing height and uh, sustained an isolated right shoulder injury. Um, so these are the three views of the patient's right shoulder at his initial presentation. Uh, there is a displaced surgical neck fracture. The alignment look, uh, looks fairly good on the AP view, uh, but the transcapillary view and the axillary view show uh, that there is a uh, the shaft is anteriorly displaced and there's a uh, apex anterior angulation deformity. Um, so he was initially treated conservatively with a uh, collar and cuff. Uh, his follow-up x-ray uh, show a lack of healing and also he continued to have pain and was not able to do much with his shoulder, even a gentle range of motion. So at two months, the decision was made to manage his fracture uh, operatively. So these are the three views of his, uh, three views of his uh, right shoulder x-ray um, um, at around two months after the injury. So AP looks uh, deceivingly, look, uh, deceivingly good in terms of alignment, uh, but uh, still at two months, there isn't much of a healing going on. And if you look at the transcapillary and x-ray view, uh, the initial deformity we saw in these views that his presentation is, uh, is worse than these views. So some of the uh, CT uh, images of his shoulder. So these are um, these are the coronal cuts. It's gonna run it one more time. And uh, these are the sagittal cuts.
and the uh, axial cuts. Okay, so uh, this patient was taken to the OR for uh, open reduction and internal fixation. And uh, due to a severe osteoporosis, uh, decision was made to utilize the fibular strut allograft. And uh, these are some of the intraoperative uh, floral shots of the patient's uh, shoulder. And you will notice that the uh, fibular strut allograft was utilized uh, in a slightly different manner compared to the first case. Um, so uh, fibular strut allograft uh, is gaining popularity as an augment for surgical fixation of a proximal humerus fracture, uh, in part um, in order to address the uh, high complication rates associated with the, uh, fixing the proximal humerus fracture, such as uh, screw cutouts and uh, varus collapse. There's some biomechanical studies showing uh, increased load to failure and construct stiffness, and also uh, shows that the motion at the fracture site is reduced uh, when the fibular strut allograft was used in conjunction with the uh, proximal humerus locking plate. Um, it is utilized to provide the uh, medial uh, column support uh, and or feel the large capitary defect. Uh, most of the studies are either non-comparative case series, uh, but a couple of retrospective compare studies uh, showed some promising outcomes compared to the uh, standard um, locking plate alone. Um, the proposed indications across the studies were various malalignment, uh, lack of medial support, and or uh, severe osteoporosis. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to invite the panel for the uh, discussion of uh, surgical options for proximal humerus fracture uh, in terms of when to fix and when to replace, and uh, also discussion on use of the uh, fibular strut allograph or any other adjunct. Um, in dealing with the complicated or difficult um, proximal humerus fracture and uh, would like to hear some technical pearls um, you guys use for uh, fixing the challenging fractures. Great. Thanks, Dr. Reed, for presenting those uh, two cases. I'm wondering if we could start off with uh, Dr. Rouleau and uh, two common themes in these uh, cases were that the uh, fracture was fixed uh, kind of like in this late period of three and a half months or two and a half months. Um, can you discuss the intricacies of when you may have operated on these or switched to surgical management and, uh, and why? Thank you, that's a very nice presentation. And uh, first I can say that the surgery were amazingly well done because it's not easy, sorry. So, um, always a good timing of a text to adjust uh, when I'm talking. So, uh, uh, my first message is first, um, the neck fracture, the surgical neck fracture is a very special family of a fracture. And regularly you see that when it's not displaced initially, but it can move uh, later. So that's something you see regularly and it's usually moving in various. So initially I would not treat it, but it's really something that can happen. Sorry, I have the kids. Oh, so I, I heard that the Montreal Canadian had some goals. So that's why we have some uh, excitement here. I'm very sorry. Um, but when you have a case where that it's not healing, before talking about surgery, you always have to think about biology. So me, I always look for thyroid problem, vitamin D deficiency. And I know we are surgeons, but it's still for me the first step when I have a patient not healing. So that's really always my first step. Um, about my surgery of choice, then I will make things very differently from you because I revised a few strut graft, um, graft, strut graft uh, inside the canal to make an arthroplasty later. And it was uh, one of the worst surgery of my life. So I'm never using um, that kind of graft personally. In the first case, I would uh, have done uh, an open reduction with iliac crest bone graft and the nail because the nail is uh, more solid than a plate to prevent uh, recurrence of virus. And also it's decreased, it's less uh, invasive in terms of uh, devascularization. When you do that kind of surgery, it's super important to keep the long head of the bicep because if you remove the long head of the bicep, you will remove the artery, the latcha artery. And also it's very important not to go in the uh, circumflex vessel area. So you keep that uh, area uh, 
safe. So me, that's what I would do, dental pectoral approach, releasing of the malunion, graft of the iliac crest, uh, reduced of the virus and a uh, uh, nail. Um, in my experience, I did that a few times. It's not a frequent problem and I always have uh, success. And in my experience, all these patients, they were always vitamin D deficiency, not just a small deficiency like 32 uh, instead of 75. Uh, or smoker or all of the above. So, so that's my, my comment. Uh, but I think the surgery was perfectly done. And I mean, it's a great, I'm sure the patient had a great outcome. It's just a question of choice. It's not uh, that I'm right or whatever, but that's, um, that would be um, my preference. Thanks very much for that. I, I agree. I, I would uh, stay away from fibular uh, strut in this particular uh, instance for the same reasons, because they usually land on my lap to do the reconstruction later on. And it, it's not the same as a femur. Uh, coring that out is really difficult uh, and maintaining enough hoop stress for your implant uh, after that is, is difficult. So I tend to agree with that. Um, Dr. Adams, um, this is deceptively hard uh, fractures because of the delay at like three and a half months or two and a half months. It's very surprising how much the humeral shaft will scallop the underside of the uh, humeral head and leave you without any kind of uh, medial uh, calcar. Is there any tips and tricks at this stage that you would use to kind of bring the, the, the fragments out of varus? Because that's always one of the trickier parts of the, uh, of the operation. Yeah, uh, thank you for presenting those cases. Those were great presentations. And um, I think that these are beautifully done cases and um, highlight some of the challenges with these cases. Just going back, if I might, to the comment about delay, I think that we certainly see that and all of us see that um, in our own offices. And for example, distal radius fractures, we uh, reduce them. We look at the alignment. It looks pretty good. We follow them. The next week, it looks a little less good. The next week, well, it's not so much of a difference. And one of the, the challenges is I like to pull up the initial post-reduction films and then compare where I am because sometimes you can be, well, it's not much different, but you realize it's quite a bit different from where it should be or where it started at. And so a lot of the time I will find myself fooled uh, because I'm following the patient or comparing to the prior films when I really want to compare to the ones um, from the initial management. So that's just a trick I've used in my practice because otherwise I, I really get fooled a lot and find that I'm somewhere I don't want to be. Um, if I if I follow further along. Uh, to your point, I think that you've outlined that beautifully and you can see how that shaft has kind of scalloped away the bone. I, I do like using the fibular strut, but I do have lots of concerns as you've outlined if the patient ultimately has to have an arthroplasty. Uh, whoever does the arthroplasty will not like you at all. Um, when you send them the patient if it fails. So I guess the ultimate result is if you think that it's going to heal, uh, fine, do it. But if you have some questions. And I'd also like to echo the thoughts about smoking cessation and bone density and vitamin D. Um, people have talked about some fortuitous ways of looking at bone density. Um, if you're getting a CT scan, there's a correlation between the Hounsfield units and the glenoid and beyond a certain level, you can basically exclude osteoporosis. So to me, that is very, very helpful in my decision-making process. If I say, okay, well, you know, this patient clearly has, um, osteopenia or osteoporosis. I'm very concerned about surgical fixation having that additional piece of information other than me looking at the x-rays and looking at their age and uh, sex and smoking history and like the second patient with his multiple risk factors, that can be very helpful. In terms of mobilizing the fragment, I think that that is a real challenge with these because as um, was outlined, you don't necessarily want to devascularize things further. Just as you outlined beautifully in your talk about getting into that kind of subacromial space and mobilizing the tissues, the rotator cuff is contracted. And so you're going to have to bring that down and mobilize the tissues to get to where you need to go. 
Um, so congratulations on those two great cases. Just want to ask that. And, and I got to apologize to Bill for putting these reconstructions on his lap when they fail. <laughs> but, uh, uh, question for John, to kind of highlight the point you we just made. Uh, if, if you're doing a nail for this, uh, how are you mobilizing the tendons? Are you still making a fairly open approach to kind of get in there and, and free those up? Or because you're going delta pec to put in graft, you're, you have access already? Or? Um, yeah, so yes, I do the delta pectoral approach for that because we need to graft. And anyway, since the URA study, I completely stopped doing any other approach for proximal mirror fracture. And a good trick for a nail in that situation is obviously you make your release as much as we describe. You can also open rotator interval um, and uh, do some kind of blunt uh, uh, mobilization inside the joint with that approach. And then on fluoroscopy uh, with a, a Steinlin pin, I try to reduce my virus as much as I can. So the pin is in the head, and then I pin the head in the best not various position as possible in the glenoid. Then I, after that, I find my entry point, you know, depends of your nail you use. Me, I use a nail where it's coming on the top of the head uh, in the cartilage. So I, I put my first pin, and then I reduce the humerus by abduction of the humerus to the head. Okay, so my head's not moving anymore. It's reduced as much as I can in terms of creating more values. And um, I abduct the humerus on fluoroscopy, AP and natural, to control my flexion. That's usually an inflection and the virus. And after I continue my pin to uh, my guide pin inside the canal of the humerus, and I do my nail in that position. And doing that at the end when the nail is solid, obviously uh, the, sh the shoulder will go back in normal alignment. And I would definitely here aim to over reduce in some kind of valgus as much as I can. And I will try to impact the diaphysis in the head as well, because it will be a medial gap. So the medial gap, I will try to uh, impact it. Um, Self-isolation. Self-isolation. Sorry about that. Um, it, 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 any comments from my guest, Rick or Brad? Thanks. I'd just say that this should be prevented by hanging that arm out. And if that patient gets used to leaning on it, because it maybe feels a bit more stable, but uh, this has to be hung out hung out, hung out, and then it's got a chance never to go to Varus. But once it does, you're kind of stuck. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, I always tell my uh, patients that have proximal humeral fractures not to rest their elbow on an armrest because uh, that's a killer. They get, they get home on the couch and they put their elbow on the armrest and it just creates this deformity. So you want to make sure that they don't do that. And uh, we heard about the nail and uh, iliac crest bone graft and plates with the fibular strut. I think if you're really stuck and you don't have access to those uh, types of things like fibular strut graft, um, one of the techniques would be to pencil the humerus, uh, the distal humerus fragment, and uh, take away some of the lateral wall of the uh, head so you could uh, correct the varus alignment and impact that and, and uh, basically telescope the two bones together to give you a great bony contact. And that, that rely, uh, reliably gets you healed and also gives you some calcar support. Now, it'll be a little bit shortened, but with the two porosities intact, that's really not an issue at all. So that's one of the tricks you can use uh, if you don't have all these fancy strut graphs and uh, you don't want to go to the crest. Yeah, I agree exactly with what you just said there, Dr. Rostetsky. That, that, that would be my approach. I've gone away from using the, the allograft um, for a lot of the reasons that have been uh, outlined, especially with the, the late reconstructions and my colleagues being angry with me for using them. Uh, and I, I've not seen a lot of great literature supporting uh, better clinical outcomes other than radiographic outcomes when using them. You can make the x-rays look great, but these patients don't necessarily do better. These, these are frustrating fractures. Uh, I'm, I'm actually very happy that I get most of the lower extremity trauma and I can refer on most of these because they're very frustrating patients to, to, to follow, I find. Even if their x-rays look phenomenal, it's, it's a really difficult rehabilitation process. 
Um, the only other thing I, I, I would have added, and it's a bit contrary to Dr. Rouleau, um, and, and maybe I should be learning a little bit more from her tonight being one of the upper extremity experts, but I think it's really important actually to, to, to take the biceps tendon because it, it's such a pain generator. And anytime you go back in for revision surgery, whether it's a non-union or malunion or revising hardware, that thing is just absolutely caked in the in the bicipital groove. It's not moving. It's inflamed. And, and so I, I routinely take the biceps tendon and do a, a tenodesis. It's one of the first steps I do when I get in there. Um, and I'm releasing it through the rotator interval and uh, releasing it from the labrum and, and then taking it for, for a later repair. And uh, I've been happy with it, but again, I, I don't do a ton of these. So, so maybe I'm uh, maybe I should be a bit more careful with, uh, with these patients. I think it depends whether you're sub pec or at the level of the tuberosity. At the level of the tuberosity, there's less chance that you're going to hurt hurt vascularity. So those are some things to uh, uh, consider. I mean, these are all uh, super points on a difficult uh, fracture or malunion or a recent non-union. Uh, it depends on how you define it here. But uh, all, all super points uh, that people have made. And you can see that there's a variety of techniques because there really isn't any one definitive answer that reliably gives uh, patients a better outcome than different approaches. Would you go to the um, film before this one? Uh, and maybe the film before that. And maybe the, I think it was the other case. Uh, I was just going to make a point uh, on one of these cases, it looked like initially he had some deltoid, yeah, there, the, a little bit of deltoid atony, uh, presumably. And just to point that out for the residents, um, when you're making a decision about what to do with these patients, it's not important to assess the, the function of the axillary nerve. Um, assess the function of the deltoid. A lot of times they'll have a little bit of a deltoid atony that which resolves within a few weeks, but being aware of the status of the nerve is important uh, before you operate on them. And this one you can actually see in subsequent films, he recovers. Perfect. I was just wondering, um, in the interest of time, if we could uh, uh, move on a little bit, I think with this panel, we could talk about these fractures uh, for an hour in themselves. But uh, it, I think Dr. Uh, Rouleau had a, a case as well. I was just wondering if she'd like to go through those. I'm not super good to share screen, so um, I will work hard on this. Um, sorry. Seems like they put the button in a different place each time. <laughs> I think uh, you should be able to. Um, let's see. Okay, here. Hopefully at the top of your screen, you'll see a button that says share content. Oh, perfect. Okay, so... I started that I have uh, obviously a great conflict of interest uh, receiving funds for research and I'm receiving royalty for plates. But you saw I discuss more about nails and plates for now. So it's kind of interesting. Um, so I, I want to make some comments and it's really going in line with what was said today is actually now in the literature and a lot of uh, trauma meetings. Uh, we more discuss about conservative treatment because of the complication of the surgery. And it's also all from Profer paper that we know about. Um, and there's a lot of literature going not to fix or treat all these people. But you show exactly two cases where not operating was not necessarily going to go well for a patient. So my question about that, is it science or fashion? And I think it's really a fashion problem. The Profer paper, and I'm sure all of you spoke before about that in your program, it's not a good study. Why? Because they took only 250 patients on 1,050. So you cannot generalize the results to all proximal nerve fracture. It's a study that concerns only 
patient in the gray zone category. Patient where, uh, is it operate a surgery or not? Then, okay, you can apply Profer. But every displacement, significant displacement in young patients, they were all excluded from that paper. So really, again, I want to stick that, and I want to show you some of the profer victims I'm seeing regularly in Montreal now. So here we have a patient, and actually it's my patient, and you can have my daughter. Okay. So it's my Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. So uh, it's my patient, bilateral proximal humerus fracture. I fix her left side. I think Julien was there assisting me somewhere on the picture. It's late night. It was my first time using my plate. So I was uh, very happy. But I decided to treat the other side conservatively, and it healed well. But the patient, she's, uh, we have a lot of nice Italian people in Montreal, and they are really uh, direct, and they feel great to discuss everything. So she screamed at me, why you haven't fixed both sides, you know? Even if the left surgery was kind of the worst, uh, biggest surgery I did in my life, she was saying that, you know, the, the right side was not as good. So it's my own pro for patient uh, victim. And here is another case. Can you believe the surgeon decided not to fix that fracture? I mean, the head is looking to the deltoid. Okay, so this is a patient that will be excluded from profer. So you cannot apply the profer conclusion to her. So obviously she was miserable. So a year later, after a year of pain, I did that to her, okay? Uh, and it's a much bigger surgery when you do that a year later with a patient that is tired and not sleeping for one year than initially. Here is another patient I didn't operate on her yet. She's a 65 years old lady, but way, working, super active, doing a lot of sport. She had this very simple valgus impacted fracture more than a year ago. Not difficult to fix, but the doctor said, all oh, literature now said that your results will be as well uh, if I'm operating you or not. So my comments to resident is read carefully the literature, don't generalize the results, and continue to use the guidelines when you have, like her, she's having two centimeter displacement of her greater sporosity, according to the emerald head. This will never go well. So if you decide to not do surgery, you have to tell the patient that this will be your maximum. 90 degree of elevation, zero degree of rotation. And that's the maximum you can get and you will have pain every night for the rest of your life. Okay, so that's my practice. And uh, that was my comment for you. <laughs> but just, just before you move on, um, Dominique, I have spent 35 years in my career helping to establish that trauma is a specialty and proximal humeral fractures fit into that. And we have to have difficult decisions around difficult fractures handled by people who make these difficult decisions all day long. This is not a simple fracture problem. And I think this is the essence of the proximal humerus when it's a simple problem a non-displaced neck fracture, it should be treated non-operatively. But when you have a difficult problem, like each one of the ones that you showed, it needs to have a fracture surgeon who has all the tools in their tool bag. And this, this is the issue where we don't have patients handled appropriately in the right facility, right doctor, right time with the right operation. So I, that's my, my soapbox, but that, it's obvious to me. <laughs> Just to kind of ask about that soapbox, Dr. Buckley, and maybe in time is something we discussed earlier, like what, what do you think the role of non-op versus op trials kind of falls into that? Because, you know, sometimes that might empower someone who might not just feel comfortable with that operation, try and give them some excuse to potentially treat something non-operatively when it maybe should be operative. And it's just the lack of recognition of that being a fracture that that shouldn't apply to. Well... Herman, I, I'm, I'm so convinced that we need good science, but I'm also so convinced that we even should be more aggressive with our trials and have more institutions with more surgeons involved in even bigger trials. And what that would do is pretty soon you don't have anybody except the community surgeon. And then, you know, the level of care, the level of importance of these fractures rises up and 
everybody is more aware that we have to be careful with these fractures. I, I just think we're, we're still too a little bit lackadaisical with treating them because like Dominic says, you end up with terrible problems over the long term without right decisions made at the right time at the beginning. And I have to say that I'm a feminist. That's my other disclosure. And I see a lot of ladies, 60, 65, little bit overweight. And people think that they do nothing in their life just because they don't look uh, like an athlete. You know, but that's not true. I mean, they can be super active. They can make a lot of things around the house. They need their shoulder. Even if they look a little bit older, it's not like an athlete or whatever, but these people can be very active. So that's super important to ask the patient, what do you like to do? Because in a sedentary pe- person who just look at TV and have no expectation and is afraid of surgery and things like that, you can still do conservative treatment when there's still an indication with the displacement. But I see regularly women, and it's a women fracture, the proximal humerus fracture is female problem. And I think some people judge them very quickly saying, oh, she's 65, uh, a little bit overweight, uh, she's doing nothing. So, and I think that it's, it's, um, it's a judgment that we cannot do just by looking at someone, we need to discuss a little bit more. Great. Yeah, it's, it's a really confusing topic. Uh, what I've learned is I, I don't know very much about proximal humerus fractures after years and years of trying to, to treat them. Um, you know, like I, I have a picture that I'm looking at on my phone and I, I know it's not going to show up potentially very well, but, you know, um, I'll just flash it up there. If you guys can see that um, there's a definitive double bubble sign there because it's a head split. That's about a centimeter and a half. Uh, displaced, but she didn't want surgery. And then that's her, you know, raising her arm, you know, better than a hemiarthroplasty or, or anything with no pain, no clunk, no nothing. And, and I was told my whole life that head splits are an absolute must that you operate on them and stuff. And then she walks in and I'm just, I'm just like, I, I don't know anything about proximal humerus fractures. You know what I mean? Cause you, you can get a, a person like that. And then you could get a person that's completely debilitated by that fracture so I think we need some research to hone in on, on who is going to ultimately end up in that position of good versus bad uh, with this crazy joint that's the most flexible diarthroidal joint that every little scar tissue influences range of motion. And the center of rotation is so critical that if we switch out a reverse for a regular arthroplasty, we could completely defunction a rotator cuff almost. It's just a very unique joint. It has problems, and I think it's one of the toughest joints to get anatomic reductions on when the tuberosities are blown out. So but I'm, uh, sure, I mean, I'm sure everybody here, though, Bill, would agree that we want to have one operation. Yes. We don't want two. Yeah, and that's absolutely. why at the beginning we have to make the right choice, right surgeon, and that's the key is that we don't want two operations, one that fails and on to a second. Absolutely, absolutely. Again, in the uh, interest of time, I'm just wondering if we should move on. I was going to say that sounds like an extra point to kind of switch to a calc fracture case that uh, might actually highlight some of that. Okay, so I'll go about uh, sharing my screen here. Can you see that one now? Yep, that's coming too. Good. Okay, so on that vein, because this is what I teach and have taught forever, is that there's the patient, there's the limb. And then there's the fracture. And so here's your patient. And I want everybody to be thinking about that. He fell six feet onto hard ground. It's now day five because sometimes it takes a while for these uh, calcaneal fractures to come into your clinic. He's healthy, no diabetes, no steroids. Blood pressure is his only medication. Um, He's had hernia surgery in the past. He's a non-smoker manager, meaning that he's uh, his own businessman. This is not workers comp. He's married with kids, plays a lot of hockey. So you've got the things you need now to make a decision based on this patient. When you now look and he's compliant, that's really key is that he'll do what you say. He's a good patient. Now, when you look at the limb, the things here that are going to be significant 
are he's never injured his foot before, no other injuries, pulses are good, no nerve injury, skin condition is satisfactory, no blisters, and you can do whatever you want to this foot. So you can make whatever decisions you want. And there's only four. And those four decisions are, you can do nothing. Non-operative care works for the calcaneus. You can do a full meal deal, extended open approach. You can do a minimally invasive reduction. Don't forget the reduction. Minimally, minimally invasive reduction with percutaneous fixation. Chad Coles talked about that last week. But I'm going to emphasize the reduction. If you're going to do a percutaneous, you still have to reduce it. And then lastly, you can fuse the foot. So here's your CT images, some axials. And you'll see that he's a bit broad. This is more than a Sanders II. It stretches down into the calcaneal cuboid joint, if you're of the opinion that matters. Here's his uh, images in the coronal plane. <clears throat> Again, at least three different parts. He's got quite a large sustentacular piece. You'll note that he is uh, with his sustentaculum. That piece is a little bit into varus, but the rest of the calc, as is often the case, is into valgus. And so this unilateral statement that's made, oh, all the calcs go into varus, that's a bunch of hoo-ha. It's not correct. Here's the sagittal view. You'll see it's a tongue type, and so it splits out the back. Uh, he's quite flat. It extends quite distally, and you can see right down into the calcane calcaneal cuboid joint. Here's a 3D CT. I don't have uh, videos of it, but you can see how it's impacted. His bowler's angle is quite flat. And here from the medial side, you can see the sustentaculum. And what this is showing is that the medial sustentacular piece, or quotes the constant piece, end of quotes, is not so constant because it's uh, relatively in place in relation to the talus, but the talus is displaced in relation to the calcaneus. And so what that means is that you don't only, if you're going to do something with this, you, you don't only have to fix the all of the calcaneus to that, quotes, constant piece, but when, you're, when you are doing that, you have to fight the talus and fight the Achilles to get all of that reduced in relation to it. So you need to think about how you're going to proceed with that. Now, there's a special program that we used in Davos when we've used this as a teaching case. And you can take each little piece of this calcaneus, and there's about 12 of them, and give them a different color so that when you look at it, you can see how the calc is short in length. And with surgery on the right, you can see if you were to put it together, it's restored. The length is back. Here you can see when the height is short, the height is restored with reconstruction. Okay. Now, here it is from the posterior view. You can see how broad it is. And if you were to operate on it, how you narrow it. But you'll also note that constant piece. Look at that brown piece on the medial side. It isn't so constant. You're going to have to do your reconstruction in relation to that piece. And so build that calcaneus to that constant piece. So be thinking about it. How am I going to do that? And then the lateral wall so that it's uh, placed back in a better position. Now, here you are from the medial side. And look how that medial side piece has been pushed aside pushed out, the whole heel broadened, but the heel's also shortened. And the calcaneal cuboid joint, its relation to the sustentaculum is off. So the joint is tipped, the, the uh, subtalar joint. And it, if you were to do surgery on the right side, you have to fix that. And the joint is widened and you have to narrow it. Now, the last view is this one. Now, this is from the top. So think about it now. You're looking straight down with the talus removed onto the joint. And on the left side, you can see it's got the three pieces, the sesentacular piece, the purple piece in the middle, and then the light blue aqua piece. And now on the right side, it's all reconstructed. But look at that change in position of the sesentacular piece. So if um, you have a poor joint reduction and it's really wide, should you be looking at reducing and fixing this? So here's your case. And I'd love to hear a surgical plan from one of the uh, residents or fellows. 
First off, does it need surgery? Secondly, what your approach would be, because there's only four. You do nothing, you fuse it, you do a minimally invasive reduction with percutaneous fixation, or you do a full meal deal on it. If you are to do a reduction maneuver, how? How are you going to maintain it? And what are you going to use for your fixation? And then I'll show you what I've done. So, Bill, you take me where you want me to go with it. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the residents uh, kind of going through that would be fantastic. You go ahead. You name somebody and they can start answering. All right. Let's see here. Somebody four or five, I would think. Oh, there's a lot of people on here that I... Herm, do you see someone that would be able to take it as well? I'm just looking at... Well, I think, you know, even one of our, our fellows and one of our foot and ankle fellows like Anthony... A absolutely. Okay. Anthony, you with us? Yeah, I'm here. So let's start hearing your thoughts. Well, thank you, Dr. Buckley, for presenting it. Um, so uh, one of the foot and ankle... Uh, I did my fellowship in Vancouver and then I'm doing a trauma fellowship, an arthroplasty fellowship here at McMaster. Uh, so I've seen both sides here. So going back to your first question, do you mind just bringing up your first question there uh, that you had on your slide? Uh, yeah, well, I, I'm showing the pictures because that's what you're going to have to work on. But does it need surgery is your first question. Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, it, it's, it's important to understand like whether or not um, – the patient understands the outcomes at one year, two years, five years down the road before deciding what you need in terms so, of. So, so Lee, it, it, that, that's a lot of talk, but let, let's hear it now. He's 50. I showed you what he's about. He's a perfectly healthy business manager and he plays hockey. Mm. So, I mean, like I said, if, if you're going to talk to a patient about operative management, I think it's important to talk about both, but um, I'm more inclined to go with operative management here. Okay, but why? Why would a 50-year-old who's an active business manager deserve surgery for his foot? What, what does the literature show? So for me, my understanding with the literature, um, looking at uh, a Sanders uh, 3 or plus, that the outcomes of operative management initially – um, you may have better outcomes in terms of uh, pain at one year, but at two years, there's no difference between non-operative versus operative. Okay, so if I was to look, and this is where I've got my patient information up here, because I think it's crucial, is that he has the opportunity for you to do whatever you want to his foot. Some people you don't, and you can't treat them non-operatively just based on that. Um, right. He has with his limb... You could do most anything based on the limb. And because he's got a flat bowlers, he's got a much higher chance of needing further surgery in the future. And because his foot shape is not good and he's still playing hockey, then he should be an operative candidate. So I think, and Brad, I'll ask you, you wouldn't treat this guy non-operatively, would you? No, this is an operative no. case in my hands. And almost all of them are uh, at this point, unless they're truly undisplaced, minimally displaced, or non-compliant. Um, that, that's, those are really the, the, the absolute contraindications for me is the non-compliance. But otherwise, I think most of these patients that are uh, demonstrating any aspect of displacement do better with surgery. Okay, good. So the ability to protect it. So then if I ask our fellow, is he a fusion candidate because he's a Sanders 3? Um, no, I don't. I don't. I don't typically go with uh, fusions for patients with acute traumas. I usually wait on that. Um, I usually well, try to well. Again, the literature is pretty clear. When you've got a really badly smashed foot and a, a Sanders four fusion or operative care, it makes no difference. And so that's my only question: Does he deserve it? And the answer is no. Based on a Sanders three healthy guy, you'd like to reconstruct it to give him the best chance. But just because you don't do it doesn't mean the literature doesn't say you should. And if I have a Sanders 4, I fuse virtually all of them. And so, okay, now my next question then comes down, Anthony. If you've got this particular case, you've now got some options. You can proceed with uh, an approach which is open, minimal or open maximal. How are you going to reduce it and then maintain it? And what fixation are you going to use? So I do a little combination of both here. Uh, so I'm going to do a sinus tarsi approach, uh, but I'm also going to use uh, percutaneous uh, 
pins to help for my reduction. Um, so initially I would use the percutaneous uh, pins, one to go across to the constant fragment, which you alluded to that isn't very constant, reduce that fragment and then be able to get the heel out of varus and get it out to length uh, first with uh, one pin going from the superior anterior aspect of the calcaneus and the other one going across from lateral to medial. And then doing the sinus tarsi approach to open up, decompress the perineals and be able to reduce um, that fragment that I've already done with the percutaneous and use potentially something what more of a buttress plate to bring up and then Okay, so it. instead of at five days, he's presenting at three weeks. Can you do all that? Uh, three weeks is challenging. Once you yes. get to three weeks, it's very, very challenging to maneuver those pieces. Yeah, um, good. So you'd have to do this fully open at three weeks, but at five yeah. days, you could do virtually whatever you wanted. And that's the key. Now, as far as time, Bill, should I keep moving along then? Sounds good. Okay. So what I should do here is actually show what we did. And this is a case of uh, a heel that I did. Small incision, right subfibular. The Howarth elevator is in and it's fully deep right inside the foot, right over to the medial side. <laughs> Okay, so here we are now, and we've got that small incision, right subfibular. The Howarth elevator is in, and it's fully deep right inside the foot, right over. Now, I'm, I'm showing that because that's the only incision, and this isn't sub a, a sinus tarsi approach. This is an approach that I'm using that is below the fracture fragments. And here's my X-ray or interoperative fluoro showing what... I've done on the image with that laminar spreader. And here we have that first K-wire going in. So you can see again, the lovely reduction at the back, our K-wire coming in, and these are threaded wires coming in subchondral. Our uh, crucial angle is reduced, large void still there. And I'm just gonna show what that looks like over here now, where we've got the drill going in, threaded K-wire in place, we have to make sure as we're putting in our K wires that we stay just posterior to our laminar spreader and eventually we'll be able to take them out. We like it both. Now, you can only do that with these early ones. And this is one that, having done so many heel bones in my life, and not to brag, but it's up over 2,000 of them now. When you're dealing with calcaneal fractures, if you don't get at them early, you have to do them a full meal deal. But this was one that I was confident I could simply get in underneath and Despite the fact I filled the void, you can see that big void here, and we're at 10 weeks now with this image. These pins are in underneath. We've helped Bowler's angle. Uh, it's not perfect, but the crucial angle of Duchesne right here is pretty good. And now I'm just going to show you his result here because this is the key. If you don't have this, you can't okay, so say we've done our job. And my patient is just going to show his motion. So up and down with your motion. Good. All the way up and all the way down. I'm just going to come from the side here all the way up and all the way down. Very good. Now, I'm just going to ask for those big circles with both feet now. Excellent. Very, very good. Okay, I'm just going to get a good picture of the undersurface of that foot where those pins were. You can't see them. And then the side here where that little wound was. And there it is there. This is at six months. Very good. And now, if you can just stand up for me. I'm just going to get you to walk both away from me over to the door. Fantastic. Now, can you come back towards me now on your tippy toes, way up high? Good, and at six months, super. Now, I want you to walk away from me on your heels. Good, super. And now I just want you to come towards me, hold on to the side here and do a deep squat for me. Good, now all the way down to a deep squat. Super, and up. That's fantastic. So in summary, because I'll finish here and we can talk about it. This is one that uh, we want to minimize our complications. I've operated on so many with the extended approach. I know that that's not great because they get super stiff. The less we do, the better. And because we've only got the four choices, we have to make the right one based on the patient, the limb and the fracture. And I'm a big believer in foot shape first. It's not the joint. I'll say it again, it's not the joint, it's foot shape. Here we've made his joint much better, and you can see how good he is with just a small cut. Less is better, more cuts will lead to way more stiffness, 
And here's my last slide. And I believe this strongly, is that we need the right doctor, right time. And sometimes not everybody can cowboy up to do all the stuff that's included with giving good fracture care. Thanks. Well, a great presentation, a great result on, on uh, such a terrible fracture for that calcaneus. That's fantastic. I got a question. Um, you know, I, I'm always confused. Uh, you said early versus late doing the small incisions. Any other things that twig you into doing a small incision versus more an extended approach uh, to the heel, like fracture types or soft tissue condition? Uh, what other things are factoring into your decision these days? Or, or can you get most of these now through these small incisions? So I've been up on the podium with Roy Sanders too many times to count, and he agrees with me. We cannot get that joint perfect through the sinus tarsi approach. Everybody thinks they can. We're not getting them perfect. And your post-op CT will show that. And so I guess what I'm saying, Bill, is that if we're doing them late, just you have to be able to do the, the full meal deal operation, extended lateral. But if you can get at them early, then less is probably better. And the simple fractures, I think, are way better done through smaller cuts and smaller uh, insults to the foot because your late and long-term results will depend upon how much surgery you've done. And if you can minimize it, they'll have way better motion. And that's correlated with outcome. The more motion they've got, the better they are. Now, if you got a bunch of blisters, you've got a problem. And so that's where sometimes you have to wait. And the, the full meal deal, right now in my practice, I'm about 50% with the percutaneous reductions. I'm about 10, 15% with a full meal deal. And then the other ones, hey, I'm still 25% non-op and maybe 10, 15 fusions. So I'm not doing them all percutaneously. I think the full open reduction is for the young person who might be able to withstand a complication and a second operation. But just like we said with the proximal humerus, we want to do one operation and the right one to get the best result. Great, great. I think we have Dr. Jamal Alassiri with a question. And I'm just wondering if uh, Dr. Muellenkamp will be able to uh, field this question for Dr. Alassiri. And just a, a reminder here that... Uh, we're kind of at uh, eight o'clock or a little bit past. If you have to leave, uh, please feel free to do so. We're going to be running a little bit longer, though. If you'd like to stay, you're more than welcome to stay for uh, another case. Sorry, Dr. Alassiri. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Dr. Buckley, for a great presentation. And I have two questions, actually. First one, how you how you obtain all the um, goals with just the uh, wires? I do fix calcaneus fractures. So having like the case that you present with a couple of wires, just lifting the depressed fragment, how you maintain your height, sorry, you get the height, how you maintain the length between the calcaneal tuberosity all the way to the anterior process? Because I find that some time actually shortened. That's one. Second thing, uh, your incision, it's not a sign of starcy, it's not like the horizontal limb of the extensile, it's almost came between subfibular. Is that an extensile approach? Or, I mean, if you need to extend it, is it something you could extend, uh, extend it or not? Thank you. Go, go, go ahead, Brad. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer, actually. It's, it's kind of funny. Uh, it's nice to see that video, Rick. That was, those were actually my hands during my fellowship doing the case with you. So I show that case uh, here as well. Um, so uh, to, to answer your question, it's, it's a good question. So the first one, um, so these are threaded wires. And, and that's an important point if you're going to be doing these percutaneous. The threaded wires act like, like rebar and scaffold. Um, and actually are, are quite capable of holding the length as well as the varus valgus. And it's, it's not just a couple of wires. It needs to be a, a number of wires in, the, um, in the, the different planes that you need, depending on the fracture. So um, it, it works a lot better than you, you may imagine. Uh, I, I've transitioned largely to using um, fully threaded uh, screws, either 6.5 or, or 7.3, which I find gives me a little bit better control. And uh, I don't have the, the, the plastroom set up for managing the, the uh, percutaneous threaded wires uh, in the plastroom, but they, they do work. And then the, the complication rate, the wound complications are quite low. If you do get a complication with one of them, you can easily just pull them out. So uh, they, they were very well tolerated. Uh, for your second question, um, so it, that, that incision is extensile into the sinus tarsi. Uh, it, it'd be, if you're, you're planning to do it percutaneously, 
you should be able to be to be able to manage it with it. But if you were unhappy with your joint reduction, you do want to visualize it. You can extend it into a sinus tarsi and still see it, but uh, you wouldn't want to to bail to a lateral extensile. Perfect. Thanks for that. I think the other Brad, Dr. Brad Petrosor may have a question. No, I just had a, yeah, that was great. And um, I use a similar incision uh, for MIS stuff too. So I guess what's the tips and tricks for dealing with the lateral wall or dealing with any of that perineal impingement that you want to do? If you really want to go with that small uh, MIS lateral sort of non-sinus, non-extensile kind of approach. That's, that's my question, but that was great. It was a great video. Thank you. So it, it's interesting because when you do, uh, you know, lots of reviews as I do, you know, it, in any number of journals, you'll see that right now around the world, people have been trying sinus tarsi. They're all fed up with the extended lateral and these small cuts are happening everywhere because when you finish with your reduction, the, the best way, and it's pretty well proven now if you're using screws, as Brad has mentioned, is you need something subchondral, which is our standard subchondral screw. You need something that comes from the posterior tuberosity up the length of the calcaneus, and then usually something that comes up underneath the subchondral. So you're actually hitting that calcaneus from all three directions. So when you say, what do you do with your incision? There's lots of different things. You look at each calcaneus, and when you, you look at it, when I had all those colors, you could see, well, what do you have to do to be able to reduce it? And if you take that laminar spreader all the way across, I'm actually influencing that sustentacular piece that isn't so constant. And you put it back where it belongs, and then everything else falls into place around it. You take the guts of the subtalar joint, which have fallen into the middle, because there's always a hole there. You lift it up. Now you can start building it against it. Now, that lateral, that small lateral piece you can actually take it out. You can just push on it. Hell, I was um, one of my first calcaneal fractures. I took a mallet and we put him in the lateral position. And I just pounded it until it was in little pieces. And so you just want to narrow the hind foot, however you do it. And we've learned how to do that, whether it's open or percutaneous. I just want to make one comment on the, the pins and, and how to maintain it. And also just the patients. And I distinctly remember going around as a resident post-op day one and two on these calc fractures uh, seeing these patients with Dr. Buckley, their pins are sticking out of their heel by a few inches, and you're there talking to the patient, explaining why their pins are sticking out of their heel and how that's going to help them stay off of their foot. And the whole time we're teaching them how to make donuts with the cling and teaching them how to make these wound care donuts that they're going to make themselves and it's got them on board and they're all into their fracture. But I think that like part of that is you know, choosing the patient, talking to them, then also scaring the hell <laughs> so they're not going to walk yeah. out. Because we know that calc patients are some of the most unreliable, non-compliant in all of our practice, and that a lot of people walk in your work. And if you can't make that calcaneus so solid, and of course, one way to keep them off it is you leave those pins hanging out and they don't walk on my work, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I think uh, Dr. Camp has a, a case as well. And I'm wondering if we should move on to that. I think it's probably going to highlight some uh, even more of these points uh, for this great discussion. Yeah, I'd be great if Brad you have time. But hopefully people don't mind staying a little late. If you have to leave, totally understand. But, uh, you know, thanks if you don't mind. I'll turn over to Brad. And yeah, that'd, that'd be great. Um, we'll, we'll try to keep it brief and, and uh, the discussion to the point. I'm actually going to have my, my resident, uh, Dr. Bill Haddon, present the case. He's uh, one of our third year residents here in Ottawa. He, he just came off of, I think, about a four month tour in, in trauma and really embraced it and, uh, and ran with it. So I think he's one of our, our up and coming trauma guys. So uh, I'd like to welcome Bill to share the slides and go through the case with maybe a maybe a PGY three or four who's interested in going through the case with him. Thanks, Dr. Mielenkamp. Thanks everybody for inviting me, having me here. And uh, thanks Dr. Mielenkamp for letting me um, share one of your cases. Um, is there a resident colleague out there who might help me out here with this case? Well, I see, uh, I got Dan Axelrod. I see uh, R3 out there. <laughs> hey guys. Um, I might not actually be able to help because I'm taking care of my son. Um, <laughs> apologies. I can try to do it, but I'll, uh, I might have to defer once I get started. No worries. Thanks, Dan. Um, we'll present just a quick, somewhat simple, but somewhat complicated common case that hopefully brings out some common decisions that are uh, often tricky to make, especially for someone at my level anyway. So, 
55 year old lady with type two diabetes. She's obese, hypertensive, has dyslipidemia, OSA requiring CPAP. Steps off a curb and twists her ankle. No other injuries. Presents to a peripheral hospital with these images. These x-rays are text message to Ottawa and a resident has asked for advice. Um, Dan, buddy, could you humor me and um, just describe the x-rays? Sure. So AP, mortis view and lateral of the right ankle. There's a, a fibula fracture, the level of the joint and just above the syndesmosis or Weber B type injury. The fibula looks um, out to length. There's a bony fleck off of the medial malleolus as well. The overall uh, congruency of the uh, tibial joint looks to be maintained. No evidence of meal clear space widening to my eye. And uh, on the lateral, the tibial alignment looks to be relatively well maintained. I'm not sure if there's a posterior malleolar piece. There looks to be sort of a double, uh, sorry, um, I forget the name of the sign, but there looks to be some devolucency on the AP. So I worry if there's maybe a posterior malleolar fracture. What would you like next, Dan? Um, I think uh, I would do, I, I, considering I'm concerned about the posterior mal, I think I would get a CT scan. So thank you. Excellent answer. Um, that wasn't done. So a stress radiograph was obtained at the peripheral hospital and sent um, to Ottawa. Um, I'll, uh, I'll save you some time here. Um, AP and attempted Mortise, uh, redemonstrating what you've already discussed. And um, perhaps everyone or many people are wondering about the posterior mal and this uh, ghost-like lucency that you can see on the AP. Uh, in any case, this patient was sent home in an air cast. Weight bearing is tolerated with one week follow-up. So one week later, presents to Fracture Clinic with these images. And uh, Dan, could you please just quickly go through these? Yeah, so um, progression of uh, her injury with uh, uh, tibial tailor displacement. If the posterior malleolar fracture is more readily visible, uh, visualized. It's, um, you know, it's not important to say the size, but in this case, I'd say it's about a third of the articular surface. Yeah. Um, this patient needs a closed reduction and a good cast. Excellent. So th this is your closed reduction and McMaster, this is your chance to critique an Ottawa reduction. Um, what would you do? Um, so yeah, so there's a post reduction films. I appreciate the opportunity to critique your work. So, <laughs> but I'm not going to uh, take, take the uh, carrot there. Uh, so, I mean, it's, I think in this circumstance, it's an operative injury. So the most important thing is to get the tibia, a talus surface underneath the ta uh, the talus underneath the tibia, um, and appropriately uh, the appropriate dorsiflexion. Um, I think the cast is adequate. It could have been a bit of more of a varus mold that could have been achieved to close off that medial clear space, but otherwise, I think it's okay. Yeah, great. Um, I agree. Uh, junior resident was quite worried. Re reduced, got this. Re reduced, got this. Um, same reduction, proceeded to CT scan. So this is perhaps a point of discussion for later about the utility of CT in this situation. Um, these are your CTs. If you want to let it flow for a minute and then um, maybe just what you think about the key important features of this CT. Yeah, so I mean, obviously scrutinize it as best I could with uh, my own two eyes before making the operative plan, but it looks like the posterior malleolar fragment is posterior medial. Um, it looks to be relatively large. Um, and it looks like the talus is still subluxated underneath the tibia. So I think that that would warrant, in my in, in my consideration, I think it would warrant open directional fixation. Um, and I can get to the operative plan later, if that's interesting to you. 
Yeah, that's great. Um, thanks, Dan. Yeah, great um, points that you've made. It obviously is still subluxated. There's an incarcerated fragment in the um, depressed joint fragment. There's also a small AITFL avulsion here. And then the a bit of a uncommon or less common posterior medial fragment that involves the posterior colliculus of the medial malleolus. Um, but yeah, great. Okay, so um, you said this is operative. Um, I think most would agree. Uh, what would be your approach? It's actually interesting, Dr. Joe Hall and I had a similar uh, fracture we managed or he managed and I watched uh, and helped him with about a month ago, maybe three weeks ago. And the discussion was made whether or not to put the patient prone for this sort of injury. Um, the difficulty with putting a patient so I, in this circumstance, I think I'd put the patient um, supine uh, with a bumper to the hip um, and do a, a, a supine uh, approach uh, with a posterior medial incision and a lateral incision for the fibula. I would you try to get an anatomic reduction of the posterior malleolus first, uh, buttress it up either with a, a, you know, with a one through tubular plate or a T type uh, plate, a clover leaf plate, whatever I felt was most uh, appropriate for that. Um, and then I'll go to the fibula and address it as need be. Yeah, great. Um, I hope this sparks some discussion too. This that's a great answer. Would you reposition the patient? You'd keep them supine the whole time, I assume, and then uh, yeah, I think I think I'd keep them supine the whole time. the The benefit of going obviously going prone is like it's it's, it's a, maybe easier to visualize uh, from the from the posterior medial approach. Um, but then it's obviously difficult to get the fibula to be fixed at, at that point. So I think I would just go supine. Yeah. Um, great answer. And uh, lots of considerations intentionally presented an obese patient with OSA. So other considerations would be ventilating a potentially anesthetized obese patient with abdominal girth. Um, whether or not you had a Jackson table, whether or not you're going to flip if you started prone. So I think all those things are going through your head too. So, I mean, lots of considerations. We did opt to go prone here, um, at least to start with uh, posterior medial approach, as you've uh, suggested. So just briefly, a uh, skin incision, just medial to the Achilles tendon. Um, subcutaneous tissues, quite a fast approach really. And then transverse fascia here overlying the neurovascular bundle is incised and um, tibial nerve is clearly visualized, FHL, uh, clear dissection planes. And um, usually a, in the several that I've seen, a very quick approach, very uh, easy access between tissue planes and great fracture visualization. So um, given this pattern, uh, Dan, I'm, I'm sorry I'm asking you all the questions, buddy. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about which fragment you'd address first? Do you have a... Yeah, it's, it's, I don't, I mean, I don't have enough experience to say that I, you know, in my hands, I would do this or that, but... Um, I think the challenge is that you, you're sort of seeing from the medial side that puts your colliculus fragment first. And so there's a type of temptation to fix that first and then build, you know, take three pieces, turn it into two pieces and then and go further laterally and, and then take the larger posterior malleolar fragment and attach it there. So I think that's probably what I would do because I could get my cortical read first off that first fragment. It'd be easier rather than trying to get over the top and reduce it. But I understand the logic of, perhaps working through that fragment and then going more laterally and trying to open, kind of sort of opening the book and fixing it. I think both are feasible. Yeah. Again, a great answer. That's what we did actually. So step one, um, using the, the larger posterior lateral fragment as a door to flap open. Um, we already knew from the CT scan that there's an impacted smaller joint fragment. Um, so opening that door first, as you can see with the dental pick and, and then this joint fragment you can visualize clinically and radiographically here uh, was removed. And just like you suggested, the, the, the read is the medial fragment first and then door closing partially on the medial fragment with that posterior lateral fragment. 
and uh, this is provisional fixation. On the left, you can see actually a nice clinical photo of fracture reduction, 1.6 K wires. And then just like you suggested, Dan, uh, this is a 2-4 T-plate posterior lateral fragment. And then there's a, a quarter tubular 2-7. Uh, Um, so that's the posterior mal addressed. Um, what would you do next? Assuming we didn't do your supine plan, uh, would you flip them now? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I don't think I'd necessarily, I, if you could get to the lateral side easily without having to manipulate it too substantially, like you could, you can then just keep them prone, but I presume that uh, you flip them and, uh, and then went to the lateral side. Yeah. So again, good thoughts. And actually that was the initial plan, but reviewing the character of the fibular fracture, long oblique and um, amenable to PA interfragmentary compression, we actually left the patient prone. Um, but as you say, it, it's probably case specific for her. She was tolerating the surgery well. She was obese. Um, we had good access laterally, so we left her in the prone position. Okay, um, so then this is definitive fixation everywhere. And then we mentioned earlier there was maybe a small AITF elevulsion. There was also a, a small fleck off the um, with a deltoid injury or at least partial deltoid injury. Um, one last thing you would do to decide whether or not you do more operating. Yeah. So, I mean, once you fixed the posterior malin, you fixed it anatomically, you assume that the syndesmotic syndesmosis is reduced. So you can do stress views intraoperatively. You can do a clotting test and then just check what's going on, see if there's any tailored tilt, if there's any syndesmotic widening. And in this case, it looks like it's nicely aligned. So yeah, probably just leave it. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dan. Thanks for your help, buddy. Um, appreciate it. So that's exactly what's done. This is uh, the Great end. Case. Thank you for uh, sharing it, Bill. Okay, so just some summary discussion point. So um, something we can all, we can share this mistake and learn from it. Um, proper assessment of the posterior mal radiographically, especially when you're dealing with remote situations, make sure there's an adequate lateral. Um, this was missed initially by a combination of people and uh, is a good learning point. Proper reduction is important, and proper reduction is hard to get after a week being malreduced. The utility of CT, I, I assume there's some discussion coming about uh, some would CT and some would not. I, I'd argue that it was valuable in this case. It helped identify that depressed joint fragment. It also helped us plan our surgical steps, our order of reduction, and our patient positioning. And then which approach do you use to the posterior mal? I, I'm seeing a lot more of this posterior medial approach in Ottawa. And um, as a junior and experienced person who doesn't know much yet, I, it seems uh, very effective to me, um, but I'd love to hear more experienced voices on that. Then your order of fixation. What do you do first? Where do you stop? Do you reposition intraoperatively? Does the deltoid in this case need fixation? Well, arguably not with a stable syndesmosis after posterior malfixation, just like Dan was saying. And does the AITFL need fixation? Well, probably not with rotational stability um, of the fibula and the syndesmosis. Thank you everyone for listening and thanks for the invitation. Thanks, especially to Dan for helping me out there. Great. Thanks, Bill, for that uh, presentation of that case. I, I have a a question, I, 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 if Dr. Adams is still uh, online, just for the U.S. versus Canadian uh, experience, uh, I mean, tonight just it happened to be that all these cases had a delayed presentation or a delayed uh, kind of uh, ability to operate on the patient. I was just wondering if Dr. Adams has a similar experience. We have a large catchment area for a lot of our trauma centers, and, and being delayed is not necessarily abnormal here, and certainly being delayed on the board um, are you guys finding the same thing at your center or more broadly in the U.S. if you have any perspective on that? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. And with the pandemic, um, I think that there's been a heightened um, 
sense of number one, healthcare disparities um, in terms of people being able to get to medical care or appropriate medical care and also patients' level of comfort. Um, so patients may present late. So for example, I had a patient, uh, that was over 300 pounds and came in with a four month old distal biceps rupture. And I asked him, you know, what, what was uh, your thought process? And he said, well, you know, I knew the pandemic was happening and I knew you couldn't do anything about it. And so, Certainly, the at that point, a year ago, uh, we were telling people we can't do elective surgery, and they got the message loud and clear in some cases. And so there's, I, I can tell you, there's a number of patients because they were afraid to come in uh, to the medical center, uh, delayed care of their fracture, um, and because resources in some areas were stretched thin, we had a lot of people delayed as well. In the normal course of life in the U.S., uh, we not uncommonly see people delay for many of the same reasons, uh, socioeconomic reasons, lack of resources to get to a medical center. But I think the, the pandemic certainly heightened that. Uh, thanks for that. Um, Dr. Buckley, I'm always, I'm always wondering when I see these posterior mal uh, fractures, um, you know, if, if I had that degree of comminution anteriorly, I would almost call this a plafond fracture rather than an ankle fracture. But we tend to call these all ankle fractures. And I, I think they're bad actors and they, they maybe shouldn't fall into the ankle fracture category. But what are your thoughts about that when you see those posterior mouths with uh, that degree of uh, impaction? And uh, obviously, there was some point loading here on the, the tail list for a delay. But uh, with besides that point, you know, looking at that comminution and the impaction, um, is it fair to call these ankle fractures? I, I think it is because it's a twisting mechanism. That wasn't a, um, a loading mechanism. It's just that she was a bit bigger. And so, yeah, I think this is an ankle. But the key for everyone here, the key absolutely is, again, who was looking at the x-rays at the beginning? This is a large joint that was never reduced. It's a great case, Brad. And that posterior mal was there from the beginning. Volkman was an important German that everyone should know who has anything to do with orthopedics. That is called the Volkman fragment. And it's been there since forever. And it was never reduced, that ankle. It was out for days and days. And, uh, you know, I, I look at this and say it's just a matter of education. We have to educate the eMERGE staff and family docs so they recognize that uh, posterior mal. My own approach is that I like prone. I like to fix the fibula first. I do because it's an ankle fracture. If it was a pilon, I may not, but this is an ankle. Fix the fibula and then I like to use just one single approach. I know you can get a little more from the posterior medial side, but from the posterior lateral, you can fix the fibula as well with one incision. And um, I, I think we're doing a much better job of these now that we're much more aware uh, Bill, you're lucky to have a good preceptor who's taking you through all the fine points, but th this shouldn't have been missed from the beginning and needed, again, the right doctor, right team, right hospital, right time, right surgery. It's just like what I said with that first case, guys. All of these should have been treated differently from the beginning with more expert eyes. Yeah, I think you know, those are great points, and I think it's interesting to think of how systems apply to delays and and appropriate stick handling, whether you're in a public or private kind of hybrid model, there's just about recognizing where these patients need to go. And, you know, some of those specific points Billy brought up, there's, there's a lot of discussion we can have. And again, uh, totally acknowledge people might need to leave this late, but I think this is all, these are great discussion points. You two into the CT. I mean, we, we talk about that a lot. If you have a good lateral, potentially you don't need one, but you know, it helps a lot with planning and, you know, to tie it into other fractures, distal radius. We kind of talk about that at all as well. It's similar type of injuries in the upper extremity, you know, using distal radius, using CTs to help recognize and also plan. I mean, should we just rec recommend this as a more routine step evaluation for these posterior mouths or not universally yet? I can tell you, I think where we're going in the future, now that we've had so much video conferencing, is that can you imagine in a place like Canada, if we set up a video conferencing for the world and you had China, India, whoever video conferencing us saying, what do you do with this fracture? And you just had someone on call and all they did was look at the x-rays. And I mean, you need to see a patient. We all know that. I showed you even my images. 
But if we had the right doctor making the right decisions early, then even places that were a little underutilized, underserviced, under um, not enough academics doing the right thing at the right time, if you had that video service, God, you'd have much better care. Uh, so these sort of things, a plain old simple Volkman's fragment isn't missed. Yeah, yeah to, that, to that point, having a, a panel like this, you know, I, I just think about my own residency and to have a panel like this, it would have been an academic half day or, you know, some special event where we would have like flown in Dr. Buckley and everyone else, Dr. Adams, and, you know, locally, hopefully, you know, get these people all to our institution to have this chat. I mean, this is, this is game changing really. Like, yeah, we have, you know, um, a panel here that's uh, international with a wealth of experience and, you know, it's a phone call, um, you know, basically, and it's great. Uh, I think, you know, there is use for that, but at the same time, you know, I, I agree, we have to be in front of patients and, and being able to uh, examine them, but uh, just having everyone on the panel here through a phone call tonight is, is extraordinary. And I, I hope the residents and uh, appreciate that in terms of uh, training uh, that this would have been something that would have only happened once or twice a year at your institution to have such a great panel discuss these cases and, and, and walk you through them. So just a great thanks from, from me to the panel for uh, providing this uh, wealth of knowledge for us tonight, which was fantastic. I think just uh, you know to echo all those sentiments. I don't want to keep everybody too long. I think we, you know those are all excellent points. And I think if uh, we tune into the COTS meeting coming up at COA, we potentially have an opportunity to discuss some things. And we've uh, we've talked about a study where we prospectively just look at a lot of these ankle fractures and try to answer some of these questions, like we've done with Decipher and now just a radius with the COTS group. Because you know we've done the then we heard Dr. Schneider talk about the, the tightrope study. Uh, and, 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 you know, although it was a great study, it was still left a lot of questions. And, and I think RCTs looking at each one of these questions is needed, but it's, it's such a broad complement of injuries that could benefit uh, with maybe a database. So I think, you know, as all of these things can bring up lots of discussion, I think maybe we need to uh, uh, table some of the questions for maybe a COTS meeting coming up uh, and talk about planning a study to answer some of these things. And so with that, I think, you know, if everybody's okay with it, if no burning comments or questions at this time, I'd like to return everybody to the hockey game <laughs> for the second period is, is well underway. And, and thank you, everybody, so much. And thank you to the panelists and the expertise. Thank you for everybody tuning in. And thank you, uh, Bill and Chris, for moderating. It was an excellent discussion and, and always a pleasure to connect. Yeah, great to see everybody. And uh, thanks, Herman, for, for organizing this. It's a great experience. A lot of fun. Thank you for bringing recording stopped. Thanks for including Bill. I think that's uh, it's always great to meet uh, new up and coming trauma trauma keeners in, in Canada. <laughs> good job, guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Thank guys. you very much. This was great. Thanks, Julie. Have a good night, everybody. You good night. go, Abs, go. Right. Whoa. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>